approximately how long does it take to travel to Mars? Mm. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend, as we all do. <laughs> uh, about three years for a round trip. Okay. And that's not that it actually takes Why, why the round long. trip? Is that... Well, I, I was, uh, the friend you're just was asking, asking about the one-way one trip. Got it, <laughs> one got it, got it, got it. Uh, so, okay, cool. So for just like literally flying to Mars and around, it takes three years. There's some interstitial time there because you really can only go between Earth and Mars at certain points in their orbits where it's favorable to make that journey. And so part of that three years is you take the journey to Mars a few months, six to nine months. You're there for a period of time until the orbits find a favorable alignment again. And then you come back another six to nine months. So one way travel, six to nine months. They hang out there on vacation and come back. Forced vacation. Forced vacation. <laughs> you come back. Well, me who loves working all the time, all vacation is forced vacation. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, okay. So that gives us a sense of, of duration. And we can maybe also talk about longer and longer and longer duration right. uh, as well. What are the hardest aspects of this, of living in space for mm -hmm. many days, for let's say 100 days, 200 days? Maybe there's a threshold when it gets really tough. What are What are some stupid little things or big things that are very difficult for human beings to go through? So one big thing and one little thing. And there are these two classic problems that we're trying to solve in the space industry. One is radiation. It's not as much of a problem for us right now on the International Space Station because we're still protected by part of Earth's magnetosphere. But as soon as you get farther out into space and you don't have that protection, once you leave the Van Allen uh, belt area of the Earth and the you know cocoon around the Earth, we have really serious concerns about radiation and the effect on human health long-term. That's the big one. The small one, and I say it's small because it seems mundane, but it actually is really big in its own way, is mental health and how to keep people happy and balanced. And you were alluding to some of the psychological challenges of having humans together on missions, and especially as we try to scale the number of humans in orbit or in space. So that's another big challenge is how to keep people happy and balanced and cooperating that's not an issue on Earth at all. At all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll talk about each of those in, the, in a bit more detail. But let me continue on the chain of dumb questions. What about food? Mm -hmm. What's a good food source for food in space? Uh, and what are some sort of standard go-to meals, menus? Right now, your go-to menu is going to be mostly freeze-dried. Every so often, NASA will arrange for a fun stunt or fresh food to get up to station. So they did bake double tree cookies with Hilton a couple years ago, as I recall, I think sometime before the pandemic. But there's work actually in our lab at MIT. Maggie Koblenz, one of my staff researchers, is looking at the future of fermentation. Everybody loves beer, right? Beer and wine and kimchi and miso, these foods that have just been, you know, really important to human cultures for eons because we love the umami and the better flavor in them. But it turns out they also have a good shelf life if done properly. And they also have an additional health benefit for the microbiome, for probiotics and prebiotics. So we're trying to work with NASA and convince them to be more open-minded to fermented food mm -hmm. for long-duration deep space missions. That we think is one of the future elements in addition to in situ growing your own food. No, okay. This is this is essential for the space party is the yes. the space beer. Yes, it's the fermented product, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. In terms of water, what's a good source of drinkable water? Like where do you get water? Do you have to always bring it on board with you? Mm -hmm. And is there a comp compressed efficient way of storing it? So to steal a line from Charlie Bolden, who's the former administrator of NASA, uh, this morning's fresh water is yesterday's coffee. So if you think about what that means, you drank the coffee yesterday. Oh, right, as it travels, you, it goes fully through the body. Fully through the body as yeah. the recycling system. And then you drink what you peed out as, um, you know, clarified, uh, refined fresh water the next day. That is one source of water. Another source of water uh, in the near neighborhood of our solar system would be on the moon. So water ice deposits. There's also water on Mars. This is one of the big things that's bringing people to want to develop infrastructure on the moon is once you've gotten out of the gravity well of Earth, if you can find water on the moon and refine it, you can either make it into propellant or drinkable water for humans. And so that's really valuable as a potential gateway out into the rest of the solar system to be able to get propellant without always having to ship it up from Earth. 